Hey folks, I know I am just an old guy telling stories, but please leave a like and subscribe before we start. Let's enjoy in today's stories. Before I dive into today's stories, I want to say, disclaimer, the content presented in this video is purely for entertainment purposes. The theories discussed are speculative and are not supported by concrete evidence. They are not intended to be taken as factual information. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey Reddit, I never thought I'd be posting something like this, but I just experienced the most unsettling thing and needed to share it with someone. I should probably start with a bit of background. Like many of you, I've always been intrigued by the darker corners of the internet, the places most people avoid. It started as harmless curiosity, just poking around forums and reading up on urban legends. But recently, my curiosity led me somewhere I wish I hadn't gone. A few weeks ago, I stumbled across a thread on a well-known conspiracy subreddit. The post was vague, just a link to the dark web with a cryptic message. Proof of the divine. They're hiding the truth from us. Against my better judgment, I decided to check it out. After all, who wouldn't be curious about something like that? Navigating the dark web is tricky, but I've done it a few times before. This time felt different, though. As I delved deeper, I found myself on a site with no name, just an eerie symbol, a winged creature that looked almost human, but not quite. I clicked on it, and what I found still haunts me. The first thing I saw was a series of images. At first glance, they looked like archaeological finds, bones, artifacts, that sort of thing. But the more I looked, the stranger they became. There were remains of a creature with wings, not like a bird or a bat, but something that resembled angelic depictions from ancient art. The bones were humanoid, but the wings were unmistakably there, fragile-looking yet massive. One of the images showed a small leather-bound book found with the remains. The cover was cracked and worn, with strange symbols etched into it. Someone had taken the time to transcribe parts of it, and the translations were disturbing. The book spoke of beings who watched over humanity, not as guardians, but as something far more sinister. It suggested that these creatures had been manipulating human history for millennia, ensuring that we remained ignorant of their existence and true intentions. I couldn't stop reading. The book described horrific visions of the future, humanity's downfall orchestrated by these so-called angels. The pages were filled with cryptic warnings, predicting wars, natural disasters, and widespread chaos, all events that had seemingly come to pass. The most chilling part was a section that hinted at an impending event, something catastrophic that was yet to come. After the images, there were videos, short, grainy clips that looked like they were filmed in a hurry. They showed the excavation of the remains and the book. The people in the videos were speaking in hushed, urgent tones, clearly aware of the gravity of their find. In one clip, a researcher holds up a bone fragment and points to what looks like an ancient injury, speculating about the creature's violent past. In another, someone flips through the book, the camera lingering on the eerie illustrations of winged figures and apocalyptic scenes. One video in particular stood out. It showed a dimly lit room probably a basement. A group of people was gathered around the remains discussing what to do next. Their faces were serious, almost fearful. The audio was low, but I could make out some of the conversation. They were talking about keeping the discovery a secret, worrying about the implications if it ever got out. One of them mentioned a powerful group that wanted to keep humanity in the dark, a group that would do anything to suppress the truth. I sat there for hours, absorbing all this information, my mind racing. Who were these creatures? Were they really angels or something else entirely? And why would anyone want to hide their existence? The more I thought about it, the more unsettled I became. I had to share this with someone, but who would believe me? So here I am, posting on Reddit, hoping that someone out there can help me make sense of this. I have all the files saved, and I'm considering uploading them but I'm also terrified of what might happen if I do. What if that powerful group finds out? What if they're already watching me? Anyway, that's all for now. 
I'll keep you posted if I find out more. Has anyone else come across anything like this? I could really use some advice. Stay safe out there, folks. Hey everyone, I'm back with more updates on the unsettling discovery I stumbled upon. The last few days have been a whirlwind of paranoia and obsessive research. I haven't been able to shake off the feeling that I'm being watched, but I need to get this story out there. Here's what happened next. After my initial dive into the dark web, I decided to take a closer look at the files I had saved. I started with the images, trying to identify any details I might have missed. One particular photo caught my attention. It was a close-up of the creature's skull. There were intricate carvings on the bone, almost like runes or ancient symbols. I spent hours cross-referencing them with known languages and symbols, but nothing matched perfectly. It was as if these carvings were from a language lost to time. I then moved on to the videos. There was one I hadn't watched thoroughly before, titled Interview. It showed an older man, clearly distressed, speaking in a language I couldn't understand. Subtitles appeared after a few seconds, translating his words. He claimed to be a member of the excavation team, but what he revealed was even more chilling. The man talked about how the discovery of the winged creature was not accidental. He said they had been following a trail of ancient texts and rumors, hints scattered across the globe. These texts, according to him, were deliberately hidden by powerful entities throughout history. He mentioned secret societies, government cover-ups, and even hinted at religious institutions being involved in concealing the truth. According to him, the creatures were not just myths or religious symbols. They were real and had influenced humanity in ways we couldn't comprehend. He spoke of a particular incident where a colleague disappeared under mysterious circumstances. One day, they were discussing the implications of their find, and the next day, that person was gone, without a trace. It was then that they realized they were being monitored. The man's eyes darted around nervously as he spoke, clearly fearful for his life. In another part of the video, the same man showed more pages from the leather-bound book. These pages contained detailed drawings of the creatures in various poses, some appearing benevolent, while others depicted horrifying scenes of destruction and control. The book seemed to be a mix of a diary and a prophetic text, with the author claiming to have been in contact with these beings. One drawing in particular gave me chills. It showed a massive winged figure standing over a city in ruins. The caption read, The Harbinger of Change. According to the book, this creature would appear at a time of great upheaval to usher in a new era, one that would reshape humanity in ways we couldn't fathom. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I reached out to a friend who is a historian specializing in ancient civilizations. I knew he might be able to provide some insight into the symbols and the context of the book. When I showed him the images, he was initially skeptical, but soon became intrigued. He agreed to help me analyze the content further. Over the next few days, we pored over the material together. My friend identified some symbols as being similar to those used in ancient Mesopotamian texts, but with significant deviations. He suggested that they might represent a hybrid language or a coded message. We also noticed that the book mentioned several ancient sites around the world, places known for unexplained phenomena and mysterious ruins. As we dug deeper, we found references to a group called the Keepers of the Veil. According to the book, they were tasked with maintaining the balance between humanity and these winged beings. The keepers were said to have knowledge passed down through generations, knowledge that included ways to summon, control, or even banish these creatures. One particularly eerie passage spoke of a ritual involving a key of light, an artifact said to be able to open a portal to the realm of these beings. The book warned that using the key could have catastrophic consequences if misused, but it also hinted that the key had been lost, or hidden, centuries ago. As fascinating as all this was, it was also terrifying. If any of this were true, it meant that there was a hidden history of humanity, one that involved beings far beyond our understanding. 
And if these beings were indeed manipulating events, what did that mean for our future? I decided to post this update to see if anyone else had any pieces of the puzzle. Maybe someone out there has encountered similar stories or can provide more information about the Keepers of the Veil or the Key of Light. I'm still debating whether to upload the videos and documents I have. I'm scared of who might come after me if I do, but the truth needs to be known. Stay safe, everyone, and keep your eyes open. There's more to our world than meets the eye, and some truths are hidden in the shadows. Hey everyone, thanks for the overwhelming response to my last update. Your messages of support and curiosity have been encouraging, and some of you provided valuable insights that pushed my investigation further. Here's what's happened since my last post. After digging into the mysterious book and the eerie symbols with my historian friend, we hit a few dead ends. We needed more concrete evidence, something to validate the claims in the book. That's when I remembered an email I received shortly after my first post. It was from someone who claimed to have information about the Keepers of the Veil. Initially, I brushed it off as just another internet crank, but now it seemed worth exploring. I reached out to the person who went by the alias Raven. After a few cautious exchanges, Raven agreed to meet in a public place. We chose a quiet coffee shop downtown. When I arrived, I was greeted by a middle-aged woman with an intense gaze and an air of secrecy. She introduced herself briefly and got straight to the point. Raven told me she had been researching secret societies for years and had come across references to the keepers of the veil in various ancient texts and obscure documents. According to her, the keepers were real and had been active as recently as the early 20th century. She believed they were still operating in the shadows today though their activities had become increasingly clandestine. She handed me a folder filled with photocopied pages from old books, letters, and photographs. One photograph stood out, a faded image of a group of people standing in front of a stone structure. They were dressed in robes holding what looked like ceremonial objects. Raven pointed to the structure in the background, which had the same winged creature symbol I had seen on the dark web. According to Raven, the stone structure was a temple in a remote part of Turkey, a place known for strange occurrences and local legends about angels who visited the area long ago. She suggested that the temple might be one of the original sites where the keepers performed their rituals and kept their records. As Raven spoke, I felt a mix of excitement and dread. The more she revealed, the more real and dangerous this conspiracy seemed. She warned me to be careful as people who got too close to the truth often disappeared. Despite the fear, I knew I had to continue. I took the folder home and spent the next few days analyzing its contents. One letter, written in an old-fashioned script, was particularly intriguing. It was from a man named Elias Thornton, dated 1903, addressed to a colleague about the coming storm. Thornton wrote about discovering the key of light and the immense power it held, he warned that if it fell into the wrong hands, it could spell disaster for humanity. Thornton's letter included a crude map with coordinates leading to a location in the Turkish mountains. This had to be where the temple was. I discussed it with my historian friend, and we decided that a trip to Turkey might be the only way to get definitive answers. It was a daunting prospect, but the potential discovery was too significant to ignore. Before making any travel plans, I needed to secure my findings and ensure I wasn't walking into a trap. I encrypted all the files and sent copies to a few trusted friends with instructions to release them publicly if anything happened to me. Paranoia was becoming my constant companion, but it was a necessary precaution. I also revisited the dark web forum where I first found the link. This time I noticed a few new posts discussing similar discoveries and strange occurrences. One post caught my eye. A user claimed to have seen a winged creature in a remote village in South America. The creature was described as both beautiful and terrifying, disappearing into the night sky. The post included blurry photos, reminiscent of the remains I had seen. These posts suggested that sightings of such beings were more common than I initially thought. 
and perhaps the conspiracy was more widespread. The implications were staggering. If these creatures existed and were active around the world, what else were we missing? I continued to piece together the puzzle, now more determined than ever to uncover the truth. Raven's information and Thornton's letter pointed to a hidden history, one that had been meticulously concealed. I was inching closer to revelations that could change our understanding of human history and our place in the universe. As I prepare for the next steps, I can't help but feel a mixture of fear and exhilaration. The journey ahead is fraught with danger, but the truth must be uncovered. If anyone has more information or has encountered similar stories, please share. We're all in this together. Stay vigilant, everyone. The shadows hide more than we can imagine, and sometimes they reveal truths we're not ready to face. Hey everyone, I'm back with more updates. Things have escalated quickly and the line between curiosity and obsession is getting thinner by the day. Here's the latest on my journey to uncover the truth behind the winged creature and the keepers of the veil. After a lot of preparation, my historian friend John and I booked our flights to Turkey. We kept our plans under wraps, telling only a few trusted people. Given the mysterious nature of our investigation, the last thing we wanted was to attract unwanted attention. The flight was uneventful, but as we descended into Istanbul, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. We rented a car and drove to the remote location indicated on Thornton's map. The journey was long and arduous, taking us through rugged terrain and isolated villages. Locals were friendly but cautious, their eyes filled with unspoken stories. When we mentioned the ancient temple, they exchanged worried glances and whispered among themselves. It was clear that the legend of the winged creatures still haunted this place. After a few days of searching, we finally arrived at the coordinates. Nestled between two imposing mountains was the temple, or what remained of it. The structure was mostly ruins, overgrown with vegetation, but the winged creature symbol was unmistakable, carved into the stone entrance. We set up camp nearby, planning to explore the temple at first light. That night, as we sat by the fire, John and I pored over the documents Raven had given me. One passage from Thornton's letter stood out. The temple holds more than relics. It is a gateway, a place where the veil between worlds is thin. It was cryptic, but suggested that the temple had a deeper significance than just being an ancient site. The next morning, we began our exploration. The air inside the temple was thick with age and mystery. As we ventured deeper, we found more symbols and carvings, many of which matched those in the book. We documented everything, taking photographs and notes, trying to piece together the story these walls were telling. In one of the inner chambers, we found a large stone altar. It was covered in dust, but beneath it, we uncovered an old chest. My heart raced as we pried it open, revealing a collection of scrolls, more intricately carved bones, and what looked like ritualistic tools. Among the scrolls, there was one that caught our attention immediately. It was a detailed account of a ritual involving the Key of Light. The scroll described how the key was used to summon the winged beings, allowing them to interact with our world. It spoke of sacrifices, not of life, but of knowledge and power given willingly by the keepers to maintain balance. The scroll also contained a warning. To misuse the key is to invite chaos. The implications were terrifying. If this artifact fell into the wrong hands, it could bring about the very destruction the book had warned about. We spent hours cataloging the contents of the chest, but our discovery was interrupted by a noise from outside. John and I exchanged worried glances and quickly hid the chest. We cautiously made our way to the temple entrance, where we saw a figure in the distance moving towards us. My heart pounded. Had someone followed us? As the figure approached, we saw it was an elderly man, dressed in traditional clothing. He introduced himself as Mehmet, a local historian who had been watching us since our arrival. Mehmet spoke of the temple's dark history and the legends of the winged creatures. 
He had been studying the myths for years and knew of the keepers. He warned us that our presence here was dangerous, as there were still those who wished to keep these secrets buried. Mehmet revealed that he had been following clues of his own and believed the Key of Light was hidden somewhere in the temple. He offered to help us, but only if we promised to handle the discovery with the utmost care. We agreed, and with his guidance, we continued our search. In a hidden chamber beneath the altar, we found a small, ornate box. Inside was a crystal-like object, radiating a faint, ethereal glow. This, Mehmet confirmed, was the key of light. The air around us felt charged with energy, and I could sense the immense power the key held. As we carefully packed the key and our findings, Mehmet urged us to leave immediately. He believed others would come for the key, and we had to ensure it didn't fall into the wrong hands. We made our way back to the car, constantly looking over our shoulders, the weight of our discovery pressing heavily upon us. Now back in Istanbul, we're preparing to return home. We've secured the key and the documents, planning our next steps carefully. The journey has only just begun, and there's so much more to uncover. We need to understand the full extent of the key's power and the true intentions of the Keepers of the Veil. I'll keep you all updated as we move forward. This discovery could change everything, and I'm determined to see it through. Stay safe, everyone, and remember, some truths are hidden for a reason. Hey, everyone. This will probably be my final update. The past few weeks have been a whirlwind of discovery, fear, and an overwhelming sense of responsibility. Here's how it all unfolded. After securing the key of light and returning to Istanbul, John, Mehmet, and I took every precaution to ensure our findings remained safe. We booked our flights back home, keeping a low profile and splitting up the documents and artifacts between us. The journey back was tense, with every glance over my shoulder feeling like an eternity. Once home, we convened in my small apartment, turning it into a makeshift research lab. We knew that we had to fully understand the power and implications of the key before deciding on our next steps. Mehmet, with his extensive knowledge of the legends, played a crucial role in deciphering the remaining texts and guiding us through the process. One evening, as we were poring over the scrolls, John made a breakthrough. He discovered a hidden compartment within one of the older scroll cases. Inside was a smaller scroll, more fragile than the others, detailing an ancient prophecy. It spoke of a time when the veil between worlds would weaken and the key would be the only thing capable of either restoring balance or plunging the world into chaos. The prophecy mentioned a specific alignment of celestial bodies, an event that was set to occur in just a few months. This alignment, according to the text, would open a gateway allowing the beings from the other realm to cross into ours more freely. The key was described as both a tool and a weapon, capable of controlling this gateway. Realizing the urgency, we decided to seek out more experts. We reached out to a few trusted contacts in the academic and archaeological communities, people who we knew could keep a secret and would take our findings seriously. Their reactions were a mix of skepticism and awe, but as we presented the evidence, they couldn't deny the significance of our discovery. We set up a secure online repository, encrypted and accessible only to our small group, where we uploaded all the documents, images, and videos. The goal was to create a comprehensive database that could be used for further research and, if necessary, to alert the public in a controlled manner. As the days went by, we began noticing strange occurrences. Our communications were intercepted, files were mysteriously deleted, and unfamiliar faces started appearing near our homes. It became clear that we were being watched, possibly by the same powerful group Raven and Mehmet had warned us about. We took extra precautions, using encrypted messaging apps and meeting in different locations to avoid detection. One night, while going through the encrypted files, I received a message from an anonymous source. They claimed to be a former member of the Keepers of the Veil vale, and warned us that our discovery had set off alarm bells among the secretive group. The message included a dire warning. You have the power to change the course of humanity, but you also hold the key to its destruction. Choose wisely. We debated our next steps endlessly. 
the responsibility weighed heavily on us. Should we reveal everything to the world, risking widespread panic and possibly triggering the very chaos the prophecy warned about? Or should we keep it hidden, safeguarding the knowledge until we fully understood how to use it? Ultimately, we decided on a middle ground. We compiled a detailed report, omitting the most sensitive details about the key's exact location and the specifics of the ritual. We sent this report to a select group of influential people in the scientific and historical communities, ensuring that the information was in the hands of those who could make informed decisions. As for the key of light, we agreed it was too dangerous to remain in one place. We devised a plan to split it into its constituent parts and hide them in different locations around the world, with each piece entrusted to a different member of our group. This way, the key's full power could only be accessed if we all agreed to reunite the pieces. In the end, the truth remains partially hidden, but the knowledge and artifacts are safeguarded. We continue to research, staying vigilant and ready to act if necessary. The beings from the other realm, the true nature of the Keepers of the Veil, and the full potential of the key remain mysteries we are still unraveling. I hope this story has been as enlightening for you as it has been for me. Remember, the world is full of hidden truths, and sometimes it's better not to delve too deep into the shadows. Stay safe, keep your mind open, and always question the reality presented to you. Thanks for following this journey with me. I'll update if there are any significant developments, but for now, this is where our story ends. Take care, everyone. I've been a gamer for as long as I can remember. It's more than just a hobby. It's a way to unwind after a long day. A way to connect with people I would never have met otherwise. One of those people was a guy named Rick. We met on an MMO about five years ago, and over time he became more than just a gaming buddy. He became a friend. Rick was a bit of a mystery, but that's not uncommon in the gaming world. You can spend hours talking to someone without knowing their real name, where they live or what they do. But Rick and I eventually exchanged real names and even a bit about our personal lives. He was from a small town in the Midwest, had a dog named Buster, and worked some kind of IT job that he hated. One night, we were in the middle of an intense raid and everything was going as usual. We were chatting over Discord, cracking jokes and coordinating our team. Suddenly Rick mentioned something that made me pause. Hey. Have you ever heard about the dark web? He asked, almost casually, like he was asking about the weather. I laughed it off at first, thinking he was joking. Yeah, I've heard of it. Why? There's some crazy stuff there, man. I stumbled upon it the other night, and it's wild. I could hear the seriousness in his voice. It wasn't like Rick to bring up stuff like this out of the blue. What were you doing there? I asked, my curiosity piqued. Just browsing. You know, looking for some old games that aren't available anymore. But I found some really messed up forums. People talking about stuff that, well, it's better not to know. His tone had a finality to it that sent a shiver down my spine. The conversation moved on, but that mention of the dark web lingered in my mind. We finished the raid and everything seemed normal. Rick logged off with a casual, see you tomorrow, man. I logged off too, thinking nothing of it. But the next day, Rick didn't show up online. I thought maybe he was busy with work or something. Days turned into weeks and still no sign of him. I sent him messages on Discord, texted him, even tried calling his number, which went straight to voicemail every time. That's when I started to get worried. Rick was a creature of habit. He had a routine, and breaking it was unlike him. I knew his full name, so I decided to do a little bit of my own detective work. I searched for him on social media, but there was nothing. It was as if he had vanished. Months passed, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. I finally decided to hire a private detective. It wasn't cheap, but I couldn't just let this go. I needed answers. The detective, a grizzled guy named Sam, took the case. He promised to find Rick or at least figure out what happened to him. Weeks later, he came back with nothing. No traces, no records, 
not even a hint of Rick's existence. It was as if he had been wiped from the face of the earth. I was left with more questions than answers. What had Rick found on the dark web? Why did he disappear? And how could someone just vanish without a trace? I couldn't let it go. Every time I logged into the game, I expected to see his username pop up, to hear his voice again. But it never did. And that's when the nightmare started. After Rick's disappearance, life carried on, but it wasn't the same. Every evening felt a little emptier without our usual gaming sessions. The absence of his familiar banter left a void, and I couldn't shake the nagging worry about his well-being. I spent hours scouring the internet for any trace of Rick. His social media profiles were either inactive or deleted. I reached out to mutual friends we had met in the game, but none of them had heard from him either. It was as if he had vanished without a trace. The private detective Sam hadn't found any leads either. Despite my frustration, he reassured me he was still working on the case. It was a small comfort, but it wasn't enough. I needed answers. One night, about two months after Rick's disappearance, I received an email from an unknown address. The subject line read, Info about Rick. My heart raced as I opened it. The email was brief. If you want to know what happened to Rick, meet me at the Rusty Nail 10 p.m. tomorrow. The Rusty Nail was a bar on the edge of town, not exactly the safest place, but I didn't care. This was the first lead I had. The next night I arrived at the bar, a dimly lit place with a rough crowd. I scanned the room, looking for someone who might be expecting me. A man in a dark hoodie waved me over to a corner booth. He looked to be in his late thirties, unshaven and nervous. Are you the one who sent the email? I asked, sliding into the seat across from him. He nodded. Name's Jake. I knew Rick. We met through some mutual friends online. Where is he? What happened to him? My voice was a mix of desperation and hope. Jake glanced around nervously. Rick got in over his head. He was looking for something on the dark web, something he shouldn't have. People there don't like outsiders snooping around. What was he looking for? I asked, leaning in closer. He was trying to find a game, Jake said, lowering his voice. An old, obscure game that supposedly had some unusual features. But he found more than he bargained for. People started following him, threatening him. I felt a chill run down my spine. What kind of threats? Real threats, not just online trolling. They knew his real name, his address, his family. He told me he was going to disappear for a while, lay low until things blew over. And then he vanished. I finished, my heart sinking. Jake nodded. I tried to warn him, but he was determined. He thought he could outsmart them. But these people, they don't play games. I sat back, trying to process what I had just heard. Rick had always been curious, sometimes recklessly so, but I never imagined it would lead to something like this. Do you have any idea where he might have gone? I asked. Jake shook his head. No, he didn't tell me where he was going, just that he needed to get off the grid. I thanked Jake and left the bar, my mind reeling. If Rick had indeed gone into hiding, there was little chance I'd find him without more help but at least now I had some idea of what had happened. Over the next few days, I contacted Sam again, giving him the new information. He promised to dig deeper, to look into any connections Rick might have had with the dark web. Meanwhile, I couldn't help but worry about Rick. The thought of him out there, alone and in danger, kept me up at night. The gaming world we both loved had turned into a nightmare for him, and I felt helpless to do anything about it. Weeks passed with no new leads. Sam kept searching, but Rick remained a ghost. I started to lose hope, wondering if I'd ever see my friend again. Then, one night, I received another email. This time, it was from Rick's old email address. The subject line was blank, and the message was simple. Don't look for me. It's not safe.
Receiving that email from Rick's address sent my mind into overdrive. I couldn't ignore the warning, but I also couldn't let go. It was clear he was trying to protect me, but from what? And why now? I called Sam first thing the next morning, filling him in on the latest development. He advised caution, but understood my need for answers. Together, we devised a plan to gather more information without drawing too much attention. We started by examining Rick's digital footprint more closely. Sam taught me a few tricks about tracing IP addresses and checking email metadata. It was tedious work, but we eventually found something. The email had been sent from a public library in a small town two states over. Looks like Rick's still moving around, Sam noted, trying to stay off the radar. I took a few days off work and drove to the town, a quiet place with a population of just over a thousand. The library was small, quaint, and surprisingly welcoming. I spent hours there, pretending to be a tourist while subtly asking questions about any new faces in town, but no one remembered seeing anyone matching Rick's description. Back home, I felt more frustrated and worried than ever. Rick's email, though brief, seemed like a desperate plea. Despite the warning, I decided to send a reply. Rick, it's me. Please tell me where you are. I want to help. I didn't expect a response, but I hoped for one. Meanwhile, Sam continued his investigation. He dug into any possible connections Rick might have had, especially those related to his interest in the dark web. One evening, I received a call from Sam. His voice was tense. I found something. You need to see this. We met at his office, where he showed me a series of chat logs from an old forum Rick used to frequent. The conversations were mostly about obscure games, but there were mentions of a particular user who claimed to have access to exclusive dark web content. This user, going by the name Shadow Fox, was in contact with Rick, Sam explained. Their conversations get increasingly secretive, especially towards the end. Rick was asking about a game called The Door. The Door, what's that? From what I can gather, it's some kind of urban legend among gamers. Supposedly, it's an old game that leads to hidden parts of the dark web. People say once you play it, you gain access to secret forums and information. But there are also rumors that it's cursed, that bad things happen to those who play it. It sounded like something out of a bad horror movie. But I knew Rick's curiosity could have driven him to seek it out. Sam and I spent hours going through the logs, looking for clues. Late that night, as we were about to call it quits, I received another email. This time, it was from an unknown address. Meet me where we first met. It was cryptic, but I knew exactly what it meant. Rick and I had first teamed up in-game in a virtual tavern. It was where our friendship began, and apparently, where he wanted it to continue. I logged into the game and made my way to the tavern. It was empty, just as I expected given the late hour. But there, at our usual table, was a single note. I'm in trouble. Don't contact me again. Trust no one. My heart sank. Rick was deeper into something dangerous than I had realized. The fact that he reached out even in such a limited way meant he was still out there, still fighting to stay safe. The message left in the virtual tavern haunted me. Rick was in trouble, and the urgency of his words made it clear he was running out of time. I knew I needed to dig deeper, but Rick's warning, trust no one, echoed in my mind. Paranoia began to set in. Who could I trust if not even Rick felt safe? I spent the next few days trying to piece together any additional information. I kept a low profile avoiding any unnecessary online activity and limiting my contact with Sam to secure channels. Despite the tension, I knew I had to keep pushing forward. One night, I was poring over the chat logs again when a new message popped up on my screen. It was from a user I didn't recognize. If you want to find Rick, go to this address. Attached was a set of coordinates and a time, midnight. This felt like a trap, but I couldn't ignore it. I decided to go, but took precautions. I wore dark clothes and left my phone and any identifying items at home. The location was in an industrial part of town, a place I would normally avoid, especially at night. 
As I approached the coordinates, I noticed an old warehouse, its windows dark and broken. The place looked abandoned, but I could see a faint light coming from inside. My heart pounded in my chest as I carefully made my way in. The interior was just as desolate as the exterior. Rusted machinery and broken crates littered the floor, casting eerie shadows in the dim light. I followed the light to a small room at the back of the warehouse. The door was slightly ajar, and I could hear a faint humming noise coming from within. I pushed the door open, revealing a makeshift setup of old computer equipment and a single chair. On the screen was a live chat window, and as I stepped closer, a message appeared. You shouldn't have come. I froze, my mind racing. I typed back, who are you? The response was immediate. Someone who can help, but you need to listen carefully. The screen flickered and an image of Rick appeared, looking gaunt and tired. This is Rick's last known location. He discovered something dangerous, something people don't want exposed. They've been tracking him ever since. I felt a chill run down my spine. What did he find? Evidence of a hidden network operating through the dark web, using old games as a cover. They're involved in illegal activities, probably. Rick stumbled onto it while looking for the door game. It was all starting to make sense now. Rick's curiosity had led him straight into the path of dangerous people. Where is he now, I typed. I don't know. He's gone off the grid completely but he left behind clues encrypted files that might help locate him. You need to find them before they do. My hands were shaking as I typed my next question. Where are the files? Hidden in the game, in the place where you first met. Look for the symbol of a key. The screen went black, and the warehouse lights flickered and died, plunging me into darkness. Panic set in, and I fumbled for my flashlight. I heard footsteps behind me and before I could react, a hand clamped over my mouth. I struggled, but the grip was too strong. Don't make a sound, a voice whispered in my ear. We're getting out of here. I was dragged out of the warehouse and into the night. The person let go of me once we were a safe distance away. I turned to see a young woman, her face stern and determined. I'm Lisa, she said. I was Rick's contact. He told me to watch out for you. I was stunned. Why didn't you reach out sooner? I was waiting for the right moment. They're watching everything, and one wrong move could get us both killed. We made our way to her car, and once inside, she handed me a USB drive. This has everything Rick found. It's encrypted, but with the right tools, you can unlock it. I took the drive, my mind spinning. What now? Now we stay off the grid. They're going to come after us, but you have to find those files in the game. It's the only way to locate Rick and bring down this network. As we drove away from the warehouse, I couldn't help but feel a mix of fear and determination. Rick was out there somewhere, and it was up to me to find him. The next few days were a blur of paranoia and planning. Lisa and I moved from place to place, staying in cheap motels and using cash for everything to avoid leaving a digital trail. The USB drive she gave me contained an encrypted trove of data that Rick had gathered, and I knew I had to decrypt it to find the final pieces of this puzzle. Late one night, holed up in yet another dingy motel, I finally managed to break through the encryption. The files revealed a tangled web of dark web activities, implicating several high-profile individuals and organizations. But among the data, I found something even more crucial. A series of coordinates and cryptic messages from Rick. The coordinates led to various locations in the game, each marked by the symbol of a key. Rick had hidden clues in the virtual world, knowing it was the only place where he might be able to communicate safely. I logged into the game, my hands trembling with anticipation. I returned to the tavern where Rick and I had first met. Sure enough, hidden in the corner was a small symbol of a key etched into the wooden floor. Clicking on it revealed a hidden message from Rick. Seek the three keys to unlock the door. The first key was hidden in a dungeon we used to raid together. 
It was a place I knew well, but this time it felt different. The usual monsters seemed more aggressive and the atmosphere was unnervingly tense. After hours of searching, I found the first key hidden in a chest in the deepest part of the dungeon. The second key was in an abandoned castle, another favorite haunt of ours. Navigating the castle was like revisiting old memories, but each room felt colder, more sinister. The key was hidden in the library, beneath a dusty, forgotten book. The third key was the hardest to find. It was located in a hidden cave we had only discovered once during a rare event. I almost gave up hope, but finally, I found the key embedded in the wall of the cave, glinting ominously in the torchlight. With all three keys in my possession, I returned to the tavern. The keys unlocked a hidden door behind the bar, leading to a secret room. Inside was another computer screen, this one showing a live feed of Rick. He looked exhausted but alive. Rick, I shouted into my headset. His eyes widened as he saw me. You found it. You found me. Where are you? How can I get to you? Rick's image flickered as he typed rapidly. I'm in a safe house, but they're closing in. You need to expose what you found on that USB. It's the only way to stop them. How do I do that? There's a journalist I trust. Contact them and give them everything. They'll know what to do. The screen suddenly went black and a chilling voice echoed through my headset. You shouldn't have done that. My computer shut down and the room plunged into darkness. Panic surged through me as I grabbed my things and rushed out of the motel room, meeting Lisa in the car. We need to move now, I yelled. We sped away, the weight of the USB drive feeling heavier in my pocket. I contacted the journalist Rick mentioned, explaining everything as best as I could. They agreed to meet us at a secure location. When we arrived, the journalist, an older woman with a steely gaze, took the drive from me. This is big. It's going to shake things up, but it's the only way to keep you and Rick safe. Over the next few days, the information was released to the public. The network Rick had uncovered was exposed, leading to numerous arrests and investigations. It was a victory, but a bittersweet one. Rick was still out there, in hiding. Weeks later, I received a final message from Rick. It was brief, but reassuring. I'm safe. Thank you for everything. Stay vigilant. The nightmare was over, but the memories lingered. I returned to gaming, but it was never quite the same. Every time I logged in, I hoped to see Rick's username pop up to hear his voice again. But I knew he was out there, living in the shadows, always one step ahead of those who would silence him. I never stopped looking, never stopped hoping because that's what friends do. They never give up on each other, no matter how dark the path may become.